So when uh, Ronan uh, asked me to do this, he presented this as it's going to be like 20 people in some backyard. <laughs> and now we have hundreds of people and the bombastic title of is blockchain the answer to fairness. So I guess we should all just relax and try to, um, you know, live through this in one piece. Um, I'm so happy to have this panel with me here because it's indeed a tough topic and I guess that on average, we will know what we're talking about. So um, I, I, I will present my panelists with your permission. Uh, we have uh, Dovi Wan. Dovi uh, recently uh, started a VC called Primitive Ventures, but not many people know that Dovi started her career in eBay as a data scientist and has really, you know, gotten her hands dirty and understood the difficulties of, of you know, an employee in those systems. And now as an investor is trying to make a change so that people like her with talent and not necessarily luck can actually strive. So Dovi, uh, for full disclosure, is a board member in Space Mesh and an investor. Um, also on our panel is um, Alex Back. Alex uh, used to run the network investment for Bank Capital. He's now already uh, renounced as, as Dragonfly Capital, but I think more details will follow on that soon. Um, Alex has essentially relocated himself to Hong Kong to invest on behalf of Harbor Ventures and have spent a great deal of time in Asia, understand the Asian line of thinking, and has recently returned, spent time as partner in, in AngelList and now and then Bank Capital. And to my right is my friend, Lasse. Lasse is an investor on behalf of uh, 1KX. Um, I think prior to uh, essentially diving into the blockchain field, Lasse has made uh, uh, the biggest uh, carpool sharing um, application in Germany, which has been a tremendous success. And Lasse, a fun fact about Lasse is that he is the first one that actually made me believe in the space mesh potential and have essentially pushed me into to doing this. So thank you everyone for joining me. As I've said, we're uh, trying to figure out what is fairness? Are we fair right now? And what should we do with or without blockchain in order to improve fairness? So without any further ado, I will start with you, Alex, and please suggest what is fairness in your mind so, you know, you won't get lost. Okay. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, this is a, so fairness is a big, uh, a big topic in crypto um, and in life. I guess I'll just start, when I think about fairness in blockchains um, and in general, I'll just talk about like sort of the main thing I find most innovative uh, and incredible about blockchains as it relates to fairness. Um, so I think sort of like, if you think about it from a little sort of high-level philosophical perspective to start, um, generally liberals, like most philosophers today, think about fairness in two ways. One, uh, things are fair if you can maximize liberty, right? Um, if you, if you like, maximize people's individual rights and freedoms. Uh, but two, things are fair if you have equal opportunity um, to succeed, to access resources, things like that. Um, now, the problem generally in philosophy, this is what philosophers talk about, is... Uh, is, is two necessarily violates one, right? Um, just the very basic principle of, like the very basic thing of taxes, for instance, this obvious thing that we all have to do, is technically, and this isn't even a crazy libertarian thing to say, technically taxes, um, they, uh, you know, they take away your property, right? So they violate your individual rights a little bit. Now, you don't have to be a crazy libertarian, you know, anarchist to think this. Uh, it's just necessarily true. Now, the, so the argument today is why do we have taxes? We do it because, uh, there's like an area of our lives that's public, that's a public sphere that you can't opt out of. So the most obvious thing is like the very first sentence of the Constitution of the U.S. is, you know, we have, uh, we have a, a, a central government to provide for like the common defense, right? So the right to not be blown up by like foreign, foreign invaders is, a, is very clearly a public good. So we should pay taxes for a military, right? Um, or police force or things like that. Uh, 
Uh, and then sort of the debates are like, what, what is public versus private? Is, is healthcare a public good? Is education and so forth? Are these areas of life that you can't opt out of now that if you don't have an education, college level or whatever, are you like fundamentally disadvantaged? Are your liberties taken away? And I think what's so amazing about crypto is it's this area of life that is totally voluntary, like fundamentally voluntary. It's not coercive. You could, you could exit it at any time um, and you could fork. You could do this crazy new thing which has never existed before. Um, like, like you could, for, if you, if you kind of like your community, but you don't like it fully, you could go do Bitcoin Cash or something, right? So I just, I love, I think that's one of the most fundamental innovations here about fairness, which is we have this like area of society. It's small now, you know, there's not, there's only, there's a few million people using crypto and they use it for various reasons and speculation and so forth. But tomorrow it'll be much larger and it'll be this part of society that is fundamentally fair in so far as anyone can opt out. It's not coercive. So uh, uh, that's a little bit meandering, but that's, that's what I love so much about, about crypto. Dovi, I know you have an interesting perspective. <laughs> yeah, um, so full disclosure here, and the first time I met with the Tomer and I thought he was drunk. And um, like after talking with him more, and so it seems like that's just his style. Um, yeah, so I think like fairness to me, um, if okay. it's like a generic term, uh, if you think about general term of, so of like fairness, like um, Alex has talked a lot about like what's our current society that situation on like, like you said, taxation as actually like the, like just like the backbone of our fear consensus. Like why, just like why we think the fear has value because like we believe that the government can actually tax us. And um, so like a general, like a general, just general term of fairness. And so I would consider fairness is a, uh, like a meritocracy that um, like the access towards like opportunities and like acts, uh, so, the, so the access towards opportunities and resources uh, becomes like, a, so becomes a commodity. And so like that's my definition for like a general uh, like fairness. So when it comes to blockchain and I think uh, we have to distinguish like public blockchain, just a public uh, permissionless blockchain versus like private permission blockchain. Uh, so private, just like private permission blockchain, so it's basically like a few nodes, so they have to make sure like check and balance. And so I think there's, so it's just making no sense that to like talk about fairness there. And so, and then we also have some publishing out there and then so you might, so you might be able to name it and then so they can have a consensus or like quote unquote fairness over like conference call. And so like that's like definitely not fairness. And so when it comes to real fairness, uh, so in this like public blockchain, so I would consider like all the participants of the blockchain, like each nodes, so they have like fair access and like open entrance. So that's my definition of uh, fairness in the context of blockchain. Um. Yeah, I think also uh, my, my disclosure would be that this is a very uh, subjective philosophical topic, so uh, just consider it sort of personal ramblings. Um, I also might be like even more careful to <clears throat> state opinions, but just kind of ask questions because I think there's different concepts that are sort of contradictory when it comes to fairness. I think uh, there I'm with Dowie. I think for me, fairness is, is basically sort of meritocracy, meaning that, uh, you know, it's permissionless innovation. Anybody has access to, to do something. Um, uh, that the sort of the the, the, the level playing field is, is given. Um, but then on the other hand, like how do we square that? I think one very uh, fundamental human trait is individuality and uh, you know, that, that urge kind of to differentiate yourself from other people. And so that already means that I want to be smarter than other people, which already means that I'm going to try ver and work very hard for to get information advantage. I don't know if I'm an heir and my, you know, I have a rich daddy. I'm probably going to be pretty happy about that, and that means already I have uh, sort of that that meritocracy is not given because I, you know, I can uh, go to Stanford, um, uh, I can tap into the network of my father, um, right? And so then even the Economist made a made sort of a, a case for actually uh, taxation of inheritance because that would be sort of. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, leveling the playing field. On the other hand, then you really, if you say you have an inheritance tax, then you're really, really infringing on, on other people's sort of liberty and property as well. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I, I gave a heads up. I think for me, it's just, uh, it's just different questions um, that uh, sort of try to square off um, different arguments for it. And um, yeah, I hope we get closer to, at least for me personally, to under, you know, to move a little bit further on, on what could be fairness? Um, I think in, in, uh, when it comes to that question related to blockchain, I think we're getting very, very close to it. Or, we, or we're, at least we're moving closer to it because I think that concept of permissionless innovation 
is, um, you know, is really uh, celebrated here and, and sort of uh, implemented. Um, yeah, and before, you know, if you, you have a system, uh, there's basically three founders and some board members, they decide what's going to happen. And uh, if you like it, you know, you're lucky. If you don't, you're, you're just pretty unlucky. And at least here we have sort of this concept of forking. Um, which, yeah, it is fair, but then again, also like the existing chain has so much network effects. Again, it has this real advantage, right, in terms of mindshare, et cetera. And we can see this with, you know, just Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Like already Bitcoin is a catchier name. Everybody's heard about Bitcoin, so already Bitcoin Cash has a massive disadvantage. Um, yeah, I guess those would be some thought about that. So uh, I would like to share my perspective here after uh, researching this, this issue of fairness for some time now. I would like to refer to it as a constituting value. In the same manner that uh, truth constitutes science and say beauty constitutes art and justice constitutes politics, in that same way, fairness constitutes money. So essentially, by dealing with money, by essentially reinventing money, by you do acts of fairness, you essentially elaborate on the definition of what is fairness, which we essentially didn't touch. So kids have a notion of what is fair and what is not fair, but I couldn't subscribe more on, on the cautious that has to be taken when, when essentially trying to define what is fair. And I think talking about it, essentially trying to achieve it in the same way that every piece of art is expanding the concept of beauty. I would like to think of every manifestation of you know, money essentially continuing to, to try and define what is fairness. I think um, before I move on, I would like to touch another point that Lasse said. I think a uh, famous quote by a German uh, philosopher uh, which said that the problem of today's equality is that it looks more like sameness rather than oneness. And, and I think that's beautiful. I think sameness is not what we are about, but perhaps we can be more about the oneness in the sense that we are for each other. So um, why, why, Alex, why are you committed to fighting fairness? Why, what's, what's your personal motivation into fairness, I mean? Is there a specific reason you're... Okay, let's go first. Yeah. Uh, so probably I can go first for this one. Um, because I grew up in China and moved to US at, uh, at the age of 20, like after finish, so after finish my college. And so I think like you might have heard about uh, China has a very tight control on foreign exchange. Um, like because like the government is very concerned about capital flight. And so... Uh, if you're so, if you are a Chinese citizen, basically you so you will only have um, like up to fifty thousand uh, like a per headcount, and so you can only transfer renminbi to uh, U.S. dollar for like up to 50, like fifty thousand every year. Um, so like the whole thing becoming even worse, like in late uh, twenty fifteen. And so you have to go through like a very serious like qualification test and, and like KYC from the government and from so from the existing banking system back in China like in order to so in order to just move out probably ten thousand U.S. dollar. Um, so back then my younger brother was just got admitted to like U.S. college, and so my family has a very hard time just to move the money out. Um, and eventually we have no choice, basically just have to port the money uh, first into Bitcoin and then like later on to, uh, so, li so later on to US dollar. So that is my first, so that is my first personal and first hand experience on um, like how important it is like if we can have a global liquid economy and like how critical it is that um, like when we have this alternative to our existing banking and like financial system, then we can have the access to like opportunity liquidity as well. So I think the um, so I think the capital liquidity plus information asymmetry, uh, so plus information symmetry, and um, together with like opportunity liquidity, so like that's the so that is the fundamental building blocks. Uh, for like a fair society, so like that is my personal opinion, and so like that is my personal opinion and like personal experience, and that is also how so like how I uh, converted to like a crypto maximalist. Yeah, so 
we talk about real cases of real people that, that Bitcoin for once has made significant impact in their life. So I think um, the difference between fairness in blockchain and fairness in, in the whole world, the lines are a little bit blurring and I'm excited about that. Alex, you, you want to share something more? No, I, I, I wanted Dovi to go first because that was, I agree 100%. Like uh, uh, when I was, um, I only really got into crypto when I moved to Hong Kong around 2014. And before that, I thought Bitcoin was pretty stupid. I was like, why does anyone need this, this censorship resistance? Why does anyone need this like, weird, volatile currency that is unrelated to the government? Like, what? We're doing fine. We have a so We have, like, in the US, we're, we're blessed with probably the most, um, we have the most robust and best monetary policy and system the world, maybe the world has ever known. Um, it's very stable. It increases the wheels of the economy in a great way. We have a great capital for it. Like the capital markets are the most robust today than have ever been around in history. Like it's very easy to get lending. And even if you're a start, I mean, you know, we live in these high, these low interest rate times. But but it's if you have, if you're a startup and you have a great idea, like it's not. Uh, it's this is the easiest time ever to raise like a reasonable amount of money to get started. Um, so so you know, to me, living in the U.S. is like, what is the value of this thing? Um, but then I think going to Hong Kong and, and spending time in Asia actually change that. I mean, you know, in Asia and the developing world, we have these economies, these people that like most many people are, there's like tens of millions of people that are unbanked but have cell phones. And so they have Facebook and they have Messenger and WhatsApp or WeChat or whatever, but they don't have a bank account. They don't have a credit score. Um, they can't access lending markets. They can't access capital to, to facilitate their businesses and their livelihood. Um, and so crypto is, or they have access, or they're, they're sort of forced into this a monetary policy that is very restrictive and is problematic. And if you're in Venezuela, like too bad, like because of where you grew up and where your parents live and your home, uh, you can just, your whole savings could disappear in, you know, a couple months. Um, so that I think that's kind of my thesis with, uh, with crypto too, that just like a lot of the biggest uses of crypto and this goes to fairness, but just uses in general are outside of the U S and outside of the Western world. So I think we all really need to sort of like put our empathy hats on and think about Think about use cases for outside of America when we're building, you know? Um, yeah, for me, it's, it's quite personal. So I'm like, um, <clears throat> I, I got a scholarship to an uh, expensive private university. And so I was basically constantly surrounded by people who had, um, just because of the sort of genetic lottery, how they were born, had like massive advantages over me. Um, financially, um, sort of in terms of network, when we had to get internships, the, you know, daddy got them an internship, etc. So for me, just personally, I always had this, uh, this sort of um, personal vendetta against like trust fund kids who are, you know, most of the times not very honestly kind of useless, but, um, you know, just are doing pretty well. And so for me, this concept of permissionless innovation, um, I think that uh, that just personally uh, resonates very, very much with me. One thing I want to, um, so one thing I want to add on here is um, because uh, we are all in like Valley or like San Francisco, so I've been here for like eight years now, and like SF is a big bubble. Um, but the thing is that like, um, like crypto might be the first sector, like just like, if you like just looking back in the history, right? So everything is born here seems to be, uh, all the way from Intel, Cisco, like Google, Facebook, Uber. But I think like crypto might be the first sector that Silicon Valley or like even US has no unfair advantage. Um, because like the global, so because like the, like the holy, so like the holy liquidity is global and like the access to capital talents and community are global. And just I think about the top 20 coins out there and only four of them are originate from US. Um, so I think this time is definitely much more fair, like in like a broader term, like if you think about from Mac, so from at like a very macro level. Cool. So I, I think I'm, I'm collecting two things here. Number one, fairness is about essentially non-discrimination, permissionless and trustless. But then there's this other thing which Dovi mentioned as unfair advantage, which is typically the winner uses its position to essentially change the rules or just, you know, win unproportional amount of wins out of the average. So, these are manifestations of unfairness. Um, I think what I would like to ask you, and, and that's a difficult question, is about profits versus value. So is profit making indeed value creation and is speculation essentially fair? 
Um, I think that's, yeah, that's another reason, actually. I think, um, yeah, profits, we, fundamentally, I think a for-profit company is, is flawed in the incentive structure. Um, if I'm a company and then you're customers, pretty much my main incentive is to sell the cheapest things at the highest price possible. Ideally, I create lock-in, I corner my customers, I have vendor lock-in, etc. then I can, you know, extract as much rent as I want. And uh, I think Silicon Valley, you know, and then in theory, there's sort of antitrust laws and a regulator that takes care of that. I think Silicon Valley has been extremely smart at figuring out sort of this natural monopoly um, kind of model that, uh, you know, Peter Thiel famously coined with Facebook, etc. And <clears throat> And so I think, yeah, this is, you know, it sounds too, a bit too strong, but I do think that profits are kind of a profit, profit incentives are a bit of a cancer. And I do like the, I would call them experiments that are happening in this space. Um, let's say something that Ethereum that is a nonprofit. Um, and that means that these fundamentally the, the incentive to, you know, sell the biggest garbage at the highest price is kind of gone. Um, anybody can sort of become a customer by, let's say, if I need, you know, I find Ethereum useful, I want to execute some smart contracts, I need some Ether for it, but once I have Ether, it's almost unlimited the use, right? And, and, and Ethereum itself is incentivized to, to keep the, the transaction costs as low as possible. And so I think um, usually that value extraction in terms of profits is actually redis redistributed to the network, to the, to the users, to the owners. Um, um, yeah, so I think that's, um, I fundamentally see big challenges with for-profit companies and the incentive structures. If you, if you extrapolate sort of the core incentive to the maximum, the, usually the outcomes are very, very bad. Um, uh, and, you, you know, an example would be that uh, there's a study that correlates one-to-one -one the increase of, uh, the increased use of Facebook to increased attacks on immigrants in Germany. There's other studies that there's other studies that show that YouTube is radicalizing people because every video that is suggested after you finish a video needs to be more outrageous to keep you engaged, right? Okay. And so here the underlying problem is basically advertisement as sort of the monetization as a profit tool, which and the key metric for advertisement to sell more ads is engagement, right? And so then they've very smart people without th probably thinking too much into it, just sort of unleashed a machine learning algorithm and said, hey, whatever, you know, keeps people most engaged, um, let's just deliver them more of that, right? And then it turns out like two years later, people are figuring out, well, it's fake news, horrific news, things that make people angry and radicalize them that are actually the, you know, the thing that creates most engagement. Um, yeah, so those would be some thoughts of mine towards profits, uh, sort of profit driven entities and how potentially these uh, open source, non-profit tokenized ecosystems uh, as new incentive structures could be better. Can I, can I poke you on this? But yes, uh, please. So essentially, as an investor, what you're trying to achieve is multiplies on the investment for your LPs. You're trying to achieve profits for them. So essentially, you're feeding the cancer. I'm, no, I'm we, we, no, no, no. We, 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 no, we only invest in open source, non-profit tokenized software networks. We don't invest in companies. So we only want to support and push forward these type of networks that potentially have better incentive structures on the long term. Yes, yes. Right. I think like profit is a relative concept towards what's your cost, right? Um, so the problem right now is uh, when we look at traditional uh, consumer internet, like there are only two business models. One is advertising and the other one is marketplace. And um, so like the native currency for advertising is actually your attention. And like the native currency for marketplace is your trust. So we have been relying on all these uh, trusted third party like Google, Facebook, or like Amazon. Um, so they provide us a free product. And, and then we thought we have gained a lot of profits of like using them. But like the fact is, we are actually giving away our like attention and like trust like free. Like basically we're like giving away our, you know, digital bankroll like free. So like that's why all these like, incumbents and like conglomerates and you know, these like, like highly profitable like organization. So once they acquire the asset, it's almost at no cost. So like that's why I think that's problematic. And, um, and so I think like that's why blockchain can probably bring us like a bright future because um, so when we think about data ownership like democracy and so like that is actually the right way to go. Um, and as an investor, 
and we're, we are definitely profit driven. But the thing is that there's a complete, like, so there's like a fundamental differences between primary investor and also secondary investor. So secondary investor is zero sum, right? So like basically my profit is your loss. And so we as, you know, fair primary investor, and because uh, we are not investing in like a zero sum game, and we are investing in um, like a, in, uh, so we are investing in this uh, nascent primitive industry that probably can bring like a real fair society. So I think like we are totally good for that. Yeah. I would say the third, there's a third type of profit. I don't know how you would define it, but there's a third type of profit I see in society, which is, uh, which is seniorage. And that is a type of profit that we, most people weren't really aware of before crypto, which is that like currencies inflate um, for, for real reasons, and uh, there are entities that are mostly hidden that get the benefits of that inflation, and that's a, that's a profit or redistribution to society. Um, and, uh, and today, seniorage is huge. I mean, it's, it's, and mostly the people that, the beneficiaries of seniorage are, uh, are central banks. They, they were set up to do this, to benefit from seniorage, and governments. Um, sometimes they're used appropriately for taxes and, and they go back to the citizens. Sometimes they're totally misabused, like in most inflating economies uh, or hyperinflating economies. Um, and, and what's cool here, and in, in crypto, we have seniorage too. Obviously, you need, to have, you need to have new transactions and block rewards and so forth uh, to validate the security of the network. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we have workers that do it. Like, it's proof of work. So you know, miners are doing like a real, real, real task and they're getting seniors, they're getting these profits from it. And, and that's different than it used to be, you know, the financial system and government that would do it. Um, and then of course, you know, Space Mesh is a new model that has like a new twist on seniorage, right? Where the, where the, uh, where the block rewards go for like a different, a different mining mechanism than, than proof of work. Um, and that actually, so I think just like the highlighting of, of all these various hidden types of profit in society and like where they go and whether they're valuable and, and what use they have is another, is like quite an interesting, like quite an interesting uh, uh, effect of, of, of crypto. Yeah. yeah, so all of a sudden when you wear the right glasses, you think of the world unfair advantage that we've all been taught to sort of look for, find and then double down on mm -hmm. as, as something faulted because it's unfair. So essentially, the, it took me 2008 to essentially understand that, that profit creation is not value creation and there's a huge difference between the two. And I think um, the, you know, there was the famous case of that, that uh, guy that raised with hundreds of percentage the prices of the drugs of a company that he used to buy and they used to do it on, on a very perpetual basis. So it's essentially legal, extremely immoral way of, of maximizing profit. So I think to Lasse's point, what um, could be done better is that we could essentially align the interest of what we see as value creation with how we're being rewarded in a more, uh, you know, inline term. So essentially, those who really contribute to the common higher good will be rewarded as opposed to what's happening today whereby teachers and other people who are essentially worrying about the common good are very poorly rewarded because there's no infrastructure in place to, to sort of pay them back. Um, so with that sort of philosophical introduction, I, I would like to ask you about more particularly about blockchain. Um, we know that in order for blockchain to be essentially good, it needs to sustain 100% permissionless, trustless in the sense that there's low barrier to entry and everybody can play. How are we doing on that front? Why is it that I cannot mine Bitcoin or Ethereum with my machine at home right now. And, and how do you think it's going to evolve over time? Um, so I think on, on, on one side, I find models like basic attention token really interesting um, because it allows, there's a big friction for many, many people who are not technically very savvy to get into crypto. I think once you have it, it feels very free and you can do anything you want, right? It's permissionless and you have access to all these sort of financial products, you're basically banked, anything that crypto can come up with, you will have access to it, right? It is, it's not censored. 
but it's kind of hard to get that first part. And I do like these models, like basic attention token, where they take a lot of sort of advertisement or money, professional money, they convert it into crypto and then sort of distribute it very, very far and wide. I do think there's also something, was something very, very powerful about Bitcoin back then when you could mine it on your PC or even laptop. And I think this is in my, as far as I can tell, probably what created the biggest sort of this Bitcoin maximalism cult is people who had that really, really fair access to it and, uh, and <clears throat> got rewarded tremendously for it. Now, the funny thing is though, they are, again, now they're in the position where they really want to protect their thing, right? So let's make Bitcoin maximalism. Every other coin is a scam. Bitcoin is the only real thing, but yeah, that might also be because you were one of the few that had this access out of nowhere. And now you're sort of the establishment and now you don't want anyone else to have that sort of, um, that sort of opportunity anymore. Um, uh, then without, you know, this is why I'm, I'm sort of uh, very, very bullish about proof of space time because potentially it has, uh, it has the, the opportunity to create very equal access, which means you can just mine on a PC at home and you have the same economics as a professional large company with unfair advantage in terms of buying disk space, etc. Um, you, um, you have, yeah, and a way, uh, to participate at the same sort of level playing field. Um, so, like, from my perspective, because um, I think, like, just like Bitcoin nowadays and has becoming this like, digital goal, um, but there are three other problems it hasn't been solved yet. And first is the fully fungibility, and because uh, Bitcoin is actually not a fungible token. Um, so Satoshi's Bitcoin is actually different than our Bitcoin, and the virgin Bitcoin is selling at a higher price, right? And so, like, the second problem right now is that like, the transaction is like, pretty, is, like, pretty slow, and it's like, pretty expensive. And so that's why it cannot serve as like, a native like, internet cash. So we have to think about what can be the cash. And, and, so, uh, and then from like proof of work perspective, and so like the mining power uh, concentration is like one of the biggest problems right now. Um, so, so I'm very into uh, open ASIC, but like not like anti-ASIC. Um, so I'm very, very into open ASIC because um, I think like eventually, so like people are, so people are like uh, right now talking about, okay, so like big man IPO and they have like more like uh, just war chest and they can uh, like tape out like five, three nanometer and basically just like want the whole game. Um, but I think eventually like Moore's law gonna hit its bottleneck, right? And then like once Moore's law hit the bottleneck, say for instance, like three nanometer. And so like the efficiency gain is actually not gonna be, expo so, so it is like not gonna be exponential. And so at the end of the day, all the miners has to compete for where like the lowest and cheapest like electricity gonna be. And electricity by nature is like a very decentralized natural resources. So the electricity in Iceland can be cheap and the electricity in like Inner Mongolia can be cheap as well. Um, so it's very hard for any like single organization to basically own the entire cheapest electricity on earth. So I think that's eventually gonna solve, uh, so like that eventually gonna solve um, actually. Um, but like the problem right now is that where is the fair access? Because uh, even we have, you know, like, so fair electricity, but like we don't have fair access, right? Because electricity can still be concentrated at like a regional level. Like what we want is actually fair access, like especially for like consumer level mining. Um, so like that's why, and I think um, things like, like Space Mesh, and so there's other company working on like proof of space and time. Basically it's based on storage. So it is like not based on computation or like, or, or, or just like how powerful your like uh, hashing power is. So it's based on how many idle, uh, storage resources you have. And basically we have a lot of like wasted idle like storage. So like essentially when it, so essentially when it comes to like value creation or like just like um, a profit accumulation for the individual and you have actually like, like, like technically no cost. Um, so I think like if we can change the current uh, mechanism of like the proof of work, like in, so from hashing rate to something else and so like that can be the future. Yeah, so proof of work is like what used to be. I think uh, we didn't mention proof of essentially stake, which is uh, something that's dominating a lot of the newest initiatives. Uh, are we doing better on proof of stake than we did on proof of work when it comes to fairness? I, I think it's I very heard. clear. I want to I wanna just do one more sentence here, and that's, Essentially adding the thing called the 
incentive compatibility. So proof of work is clearly not incentive compatible. If I have $10 million to go create my own ethic, I will then win unproportional amount of races. This makes it essentially uh, non-linear in the reward. Um, proof of stake has attempting to achieve this linearity at the price of requiring a bond. And this bond is hurting the first primitive, which is essentially being permissionless. So uh, is that... I, I really, just someone recently told me and it really resonated with me that proof of work, proof of stake is all just proof of money. And uh, yeah, it's, it kind of is. It kind of is. So we can't build meritocracy on that because some have it, some don't. No, yep. I mean, it's, I do think as a, as a, it's, it's better than proof of work, I do think, just purely because it scales better. But I think the, <clears throat> yeah, the underlying fairness factor is not changed. Um, so there's so there's a very uh, really good like, article. So I recommend everybody to read about is um, uh, so there's article online is um, nothing is cheaper than proof of work. Um, so I think from my perspective, um, because um, energy is the ultimate currency for the universe. Um, so like there must be something rely on energy. So that you have to spend energy and you have to keep the entropy low because if you think about why we generate consensus, right? So like we human society, we organize by protocols, right? So like all the way from like sovereign states to legal system to even marriage. And so like these are all like protocols. And like, like so like the way how we have protocol is that like how we reduce the entropy level for our like human society yep. as a system. Um, so I think in, so because we so because we keep this entropy level low by generating consensus and just working around and like collaborate on like protocols, we have to dump the entropy somewhere else. So like that's why I think I'm more towards like proof of work like mass list, um, kind of uh, because I think nothing is cheaper than proof of work. Good point about entropy. I would just say, uh, yeah, I mean, security guarantees and scalability aside, proof of stake does genuinely worry me from a from like a fairness and inequality um, perspective. Uh, just because, I mean, the basic way proof of stake works is it just rewards the initial allocations of resource. Like whoever, if you own your currency, you know, like you will just continue to get a, a proportional amount or mostly proportional amount of the of the seniorage going forward. And so it rewards early, early adopters, early access, which to be fair is often like us, VC firms. Um, and then just the people that are in this room and that are very technologically aware and are just happen to be the first um, to access these currencies, which is not like, I mean, it's better, I think it's better than the status quo. It's better than like, I mean, it's not, there's nothing like, it's not like the, 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 the people who have the most wealth in the world today got it for like, necessarily fair reasons or whatever either so mm -hmm. um it's just switching the switching the allocations but yeah i worry because proof of work is interesting proof of space time these are interesting methods where like these are interesting consensus mechanisms where uh senior is rewarded for various types of actual labor actual um actual value that you create i mean miners are creating real value like people say it's so wasteful but it's not they're they're generating electricity cheaply and and, and in exchange they're providing security for like a global trustless settlement like money. It's, it's amazing what they do. Um, so yeah, I worry about proof of stake quite a bit because it's just like, it's just exacerbating what was the initial allocation. Yep. So, I don't have a good answer though to what, like how you solve it. I don't know, I mean, it's tough. Yeah. Um, so I think first of all, um, proof of, so like proof of stake, um, like, so when it comes to like security problem, right? So, but like not everything has to be on proof of work. Like not everything needs to have, you know, like, uh, like just a Pentagon level like security, right? So, so I can totally see, so I can like totally see things like, you know, like casual application be on like proof of stake. And so that's like totally fine um, because we have like multiple layers of like, you know, so all the way from like store value to like medium exchange. And so when it comes to like the upper layer and I think like things can be built on like proof of stake, uh, like a like type of consensus. So um, like, I think there must be some alternative ladder. Like, and, and so like, like the whole space is like just like too early, like to talk about competition or like to talk about, you know, like tribalism and partisan and we should all just collaborate and then like to figure out what's like the best solution. 
Yeah, clearly. I mean, I think that's the whole nation of the, what we're trying to bring. I think together we share a destiny. We're all humans. We're in it together. And, you know, the, if we can essentially find a better system that would be more fair and that would relate to talent in a more direct way, I think we've definitely have impacted positively this universe. And essentially, um, there's nothing better in life than working towards something that you believe in and that you have purpose in. So I think, I hope we've managed to convince some of you that there's purpose in what we're doing and that essentially we are looking for the fairest money to allow talented people from all over the world to feel satisfaction and to fulfill their dreams. And how early have you been into blockchain shouldn't be the criteria that decides how much money you have. Same as like who's your uh, family and where were you born. So essentially all these are secondary or ought to be secondary to talent and let's hope with the look into the future that the change is coming and we will see more social mobility and more stories like Dovi who is, uh, you know, running blockchain for us right now. So thank you everybody for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.